first thing I want to talk about was the George Floyd drawer admitting that uh, the, the result they got to was sort of pre-approved. So I've seen two narratives on this. So he went out and gave a bunch of interviews um, saying that, that, you know, I was one of the jurors and here's, you know, my views on what took place in the jury room and between all the different jurors. And the left has gone with one particular part and then the right have gone with uh, another part here. So the, the first part here is the the left version of it. So this is an interview he gave on CBS and in here at this point, he says that they felt no outside pressure in the jury room. Tell me if you believe that. And the result of that is that the left is pushing that this means that Derek Chauvin's appeal is going to be rejected because the jurors have said, we felt no outside pressure, which is, uh, you just believe them on face value, even if uh, you might have different views on that, I guess. So if we get to the next link, this is Raw Story reporting here. So they, I think there's, uh, what is it? They, they took a quote from a different left-wing news outlet that were promoting that the appeal is definitely doomed because the juror came out and said, we felt no pressure. So supposedly... The people protesting outside of the courts and both Joe Biden calling George Floyd's brother had absolutely no effect whatsoever. Absolutely none. I yeah. Find, I find that very hard to believe. And, and of course, the, the explicit threats of we're going to burn this country to the ground if he's not convicted. I mean, no pressure at all. It, really? It, yeah, I mean, it's difficult to believe, but it's also especially difficult to believe from this particular juror. So I think, what was it? There were, there were 12 jurors in the jury room deciding on this case, if I got the correct. And he was one of them. And you might think he's just some rando juror, you know, completely average. I mean, remember, they filtered the jurors to decide whether or not they would accept them. And if you had strong views on BLM or George Floyd's case or something, then you were struck off because, I mean, that's the correct thing to do. And so if we can get to the, the next link, this is some of the uh, reporting at the time. So Judge Carhill asked juror number 52, this juror here, whether he heard anything about the George Floyd civil case. He says no. He explained hearing some basic info about uh, trial dates, etc., from the news in recent months, but nothing that would keep him from serving as an impartial juror. That's on the 15th of March. Completely impartial juror. Sure. Sure. Except that afterwards he's been, I'm going to say, running his mouth here, because he's been going out and exposing, ah, no, nah, actually, he wasn't an impartial juror. So we go to the next link here. This is a, a podcast in which uh, this person here has, has noted that in here he says that uh, you know, she asks, why should you go on jury duty and serve on jurors? And his result, his response is that, well, if you want to see change, you need to get on the jury. As that if, doesn't sound like an impartial juror to me. Yeah, as if that's what the jury is for. So let's play this clip. We're talking to Brandon Mitchell. He was juror number 52 in the Derek Chauvin murder trial. Brandon, before we wrap, many people don't like jury duty and probably wouldn't respond to the letter that you get in the mail. So what message would you leave to those about saying yes to jury duty? I mean, it's, it's important. If we want to see some change, we want to see some things going differently. We got to get out there and get into these avenues and get in these rooms yeah. um, to, to try to spark some change. Yeah, and that's one, and jury duty is one of the things. Jury duty, voting. All of those things are things we got to do. And how can people follow you on social media or tune into your podcast? Yeah, so the Wholesome Pod. So yeah, he's uh, just plugging his podcast there. But you can see, as he says, if we want to see some change, if we want to see some things going different, we've got to get out there and we've got to go into those avenues to spark some change. Then aren't um, there any rules against them just going out and talking about the case as well? I would imagine that there would be some limitations to jurors just going around and especially in a big case like this, it seems like he's trying to make a career out of it almost as someone who helped uh, kind of get Derek Chauvin in prison. I don't think there's any rules against after the case because, I mean, then you're a free citizen, do as you wish kind of thing. I mean, the, the, the case is done. There's no restrictions on him there. But, I mean, it's pretty telling. I mean, the fact that he's coming out there and saying you need to, you know, if you want change in society, get on a jury. And it's like... Right, that's not the purpose of a jury. Yeah, but purpose once, of a jury is to be impartial yeah, and judge them on the case of the, of the merit. But if if he's coming out of it and doing all these media kind of tours and plugging a podcast, isn't he clearly getting something out of it? Sure, but that's you know he's free to do so. I don't think there's any laws against it. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't believe there is. So this is uh, not the the only thing here. So there was also reporting on him when they were going through the the candidates. And as you can see here, this lady, she lists like all the information about all the different jurors, which again leads to the whole thing about them all kind of being doxxed. I mean, local papers releasing so much information that you could reasonably find out who the jurors were on the case. So hmm. anyway, so she says here that jury number 52, he's a black male in his 30s. He works in banking, coaches kids, has witnessed police excessive force. Discrimination is beyond what the media can even report, is his opinion. The discrimination in the policing is... Uh, beyond what the media can even report. 
It's like, right, that should have been a red flag. Yeah, impartial. And then that is apparently what impartial means. Yeah. Like, how, do they, how do they not screen that out? Surely that's a pretty fringe view, even for many like Black Lives Matter activists. So if you can, you can scroll down, I think there's a tweet below this in which he also says that he's not a huge fan of Blue Lives Matter and says it arose in opposition to Black Lives Matter. I mean, it's true that that's, uh, you know, the phraseology became new, but of course the thin blue line is a long-standing, uh, let's say, cultural meme of, of, you know, protect the police. But saying that he's not a huge fan of Blue Lives Matter, I mean, again, this this is the sort of thing where he's he's aware of the Black Lives Matter movement, he's aware of the Blue Lives Matter movement, he thinks that the amount of discrimination in policing is beyond what the media can even report, and there are some more red flags coming up. It's like, okay, did this guy actually, was he in, impartial or not? So then we have uh, him giving another interview in which he gave an interview to Law Crime Network, and he gave them his view on why they took 10 hours to come up with the deliberation that Sherman was guilty on all three charges. So you remember that, that this was the thing that they, they went in there for 10 hours. Uh, he says, no, that we didn't actually spend 10 hours on this because you've got to take into account that we had the day off and whatnot, and therefore it took a lot shorter than people think. So if we can play this second clip. And when you look at 10 hours of deliberations, um, was there one issue that the jury was struggling with over another? See, I look at it as there was cause of death and there was the use of force. Were you guys struggling over one of the issues? Um, no, not in terms of that. And when, even, even over the 10 hours, it wasn't exactly 10 hours. It was more like six hours, five or six hours. Um, but during that time, we more so... Uh, focused on the third degree murder and just the, the terminology used within it um, was a little bit confusing. But in terms of use of force or, or anything like that, I think we were all were on the same page and there was no really disputing or debating about that. So you're saying when you walked into the deliberation room, did the jury come to a decision pretty quickly on some of the charges within the first hour? Yeah, we definitely figured out manslaughter within the first hour right away. Uh, then we took a break. Uh, for dinner, actually, and then came back the next morning. Um, but yeah, man started figured out right away. Third degree took maybe three and a half hours. And then uh, the second degree murder, we figured out in maybe 30, 45 minutes. So the, the manslaughter took about one hour to figure out. Then they went for dinner. And then third degree murder took him three to four hours to talk about. And then second degree murder, about 30 minutes. And he says in, in other interviews that it was the case that all of them agreed that basically he was guilty on everything except one. And that one juror was someone who was just saying, I'm not sure about the terminology of the law. Can we go over that? So it wasn't even, I want to go through the evidence again. Let's go through the arguments for both sides. This is a very serious case, blah, blah, blah. They were just saying, let's go for the, the wording of the law because it's a bit confusing. And that sort of makes me wonder, like, okay, the, the argument that these guys weren't taking it uh, very seriously, I think, has more merit to it. If they're literally just spending like 30 minutes on second degree murder, three to four hours on third degree murder, it, it seems very lax. And... Were they, um, I was following the case relatively closely, but were they deliberating um, after each day's evidence or was it just that they were there when it was presented and then they finally got to deliberate at the end? So it was like two weeks uh, of evidence, you know, testimony, presenting videos, blah, 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 and then deliberations and the deliberations took, well, as he says, not 10 hours, but six hours. That's kind of ridiculous then if, if it's split up and, you know, one of them was half an hour. That that hardly seems like they're doing their due Jill and do you do you, I can't <laughs> anyway, but you're, you're totally right i mean it's it's certainly true proxy. that it's it's fine if there's you know say some guy comes before the court you're in the jury i didn't commit the murder the uh, the evidence is overwhelming you go to the jury room guilty 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 and then you're done right and that's that's certainly true that they could have taken that position but i mean most people who followed the case i mean it was a pretty complex case there were a lot of different arguments being made there was a lot of evidence to go through and it wasn't like the defense wasn't without merit. I mean, they, they had arguments for, for all three counts and none of them, you know, uh, trivial. So, and also people weren't expecting, especially to get him on the, the murder charges. They were, most legal experts looking at this that I've seen from the United States were saying, that's a bit of a stretch. I mean, definitely you can probably get him on the, on the manslaughter charge, but the murder charges is kind of pushing it. Yeah, I, I found the defense's case quite compelling, to be honest. I know I'm certainly no e legal expert, but it, it seemed to me that they had a pretty reasonable case and they had their own kind of counter medical experts to suggest that there was reasonable doubt. So when he was charged for all three kind of counts, I was very surprised that they'd even come to this. And it kind of makes a bit more sense now, considering that this guy perhaps might not have uh, been as impartial as he might have suggested. Mm. And in case you're, you're wondering, okay, well, he said a few things like, I think you should use jurors to make change. 
which is not what they're for, or the fact that he was talking about that he's not a fan of Blue Lives Matter. Okay, I mean, these are pretty tepid things, maybe. Uh, what's not tepid is, is, you know, video evidence of him being partisan before the case. So this is an article from, what is it, Post Millennial, in which they put here that uh, Chauvin Juro, who promised judge impartiality, now says that people should join juries to spark some change. And as you saw, we saw that part. But also wore BLM shirt in 2020. So if we can scroll down, eventually you're going to get to an image. So not this one, but if you keep going, in which he posted on Facebook of him wearing a shirt that's clearly inspired by the George Floyd tr uh, trial and BLM. So you can see here, he's on the, the right there with a hat that says Black Lives Matter. Black Lives Matter was around before, maybe. But then, get your knee off our necks, BLM, with, with two red fists in the centre there. That's not exactly mild. He's both got the shirt and the hat as well, so... Mm. I mean, he's he's literally wearing a shirt saying, get your knee off our necks. Um, I mean, if that's not a reference to George Floyd, I, I don't know what other case was going on with, with knees on necks that I'm I'm not aware of. But that's, that's just blatant. Like, he was uh, an individual who was aware of the case. He was also politically active you know, in one side of this, which is that uh, this was an atrocious abuse of civil rights and therefore his campaign against it. That means he's not impartial. That means he lied to the, the judge and the people and to the uh, council on either side when he says, oh, I'm impartial. Oh, I've not heard much about the case, blah, blah, blah. We have the video evidence. Like, you're a liar, mate. That, that, I can't believe that he's actually managed to get away with this. Like, w wouldn't this alone be case for an appeal? Because, you know, I suppose it's one of the jurors that wouldn't really change the decision overall. I think they might need more evidence on some of the other jurors. But even so, th this guy, you're not going to have the full Black Lives Matter get up if you're not involved in any way, are you? Yeah, I mean, it was pretty ridiculous with the jury not being sequestered from the get-go. I mean, like, the, def the defense was arguing this, which is like, you know, there's loads of stuff going on, loads of protests. Uh, one of these guys even lives in a city where rioting was taking place during the case. It's like, well, these guys can't be impartial by definition. But then when you've got jurors themselves who are now released to have been political activists on the jury, yeah, I mean, this is why I find it so absurd that the, the left-wing media I've seen on this have been saying that this guy's been giving the interviews and that's good because he's able to say that there was no outside pressure and therefore the appeal's going to fall flat on its face. That That's just not the case. I mean, the, the evidence of him being a political activist doesn't help uh, the state against the appeal. No, it helps the appeal. Which is the point that, no, there's, there's a miscarriage of justice, which is what the defense will be arguing. And again, I don't really care about uh, Derek Chauvin, as we've said multiple times. I don't really care if he's guilty or not. But the fact that there's not a proper procedure being taken place is a valid criticism and something that should be pointed out, I think. So if you can, you can scroll up as well, just so we can see. No, if you can scroll up a little bit, just so we can see his Facebook post. So, so sorry, go back, just so we can see the top of that Facebook post where he's writing. So the next generation being socially active, representing in DC, my son. Mazel, nephew, blah, 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 and brother, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, him saying that, that he is being politically active, wants people to get politically active in the sense of being Black Lives Matter activists, which he then went on to be on the jury in his own words. I mean, he was causing social change. I mean, that's his words of what he was doing on the jury. Yeah, and even alongside uh, the, the kind of threats of violence and burning stuff down, they were more or less living in that neighbourhood as well, and surely... That's got to play a part. I would have imagined that if you wanted a truly impartial jury, you would have probably gone out of the state entirely and gone somewhere else. At least then there'd be less of a threat of violence because, of course, in Minneapolis, there's a lot of ties to this sort of thing. And they're going to be far more willing to be active and out and causing trouble and destruction and rioting. Yeah, I mean, I don't know the system. I've heard some criticisms about getting people outside of the state to come in. But either way, I mean, definitely take it out of Minneapolis. I, mean, I can't think of a sillier thing to do, which is what the defense will be bringing up. But also the idea that there was no pressure from the outside, as he said in the initial interview. Eh, yeah. I mean, who believes this? Like, who honestly believes that? I mean, one of the jurors living in a neighborhood that had rioting during the trial. But, okay, fine. Except when you look outside, I mean, we saw the footage when we covered it of people outside chanting guilty, guilty, guilty when they were deliberating. But there's this, this great video I found from Amy Horowitz. He just went down there and started asking them questions. And of course, he's running into the BLM type, so he's going to run into some absolute nutters. But one of the, one of the worst parts here is, is, as you can get the, the quote there, one, one woman he interviews right at the end there says, I don't want to say that we have to start killing all white folks, but maybe they need to feel the pain and the hurt. And it's like, yeah... Yeah, I mean, if you didn't want it clearly enough that these people want a race war, I mean, saying we've got to kill all the white folks. But. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I don't want to kill all the white folks, 
but <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Movie. Anyway, but this this is the state outside. I mean, these are the protesters outside. Um, you saw them chanting. You've seen the amount of riots. The idea that there was no influence on the jury from the outside world. Who buys it? I mean, it's, it's just obvious nonsense. And then when you dismiss with that, you've got the the other side of it, which is him saying that, yeah, I was essentially an activist on the jury. I mean, we don't know about all the rest of them, obviously. But no, it just seems like great evidence for the appeal. Great evidence for Nelson to say that this was a mm. miscarriage of justice. I think the best thing out of everything is the fact that they had their kind of details published while the case was still going on. And then there were the threats of violence. I, and people protesting outside of the courts, if they knew who these jurors were and they were found to vote uh, in favour of Chauvin, then surely these people would be hunted down. And that's got to be a, kind of a case yeah. for... Everyone knows it, right? Yeah. And I'm amazed that no one's been talking about that and that's not been the focus, really. Hmm. But there's there's also just the, the fact that this guy, like, if you just kept your mouth shut as well, like, he didn't help his uh, his side here very much by going out and saying yes i was an activist on the jury i mean it didn't help his side by lying and saying i've not heard of the george floyd trial and then as you can see with the shirt definitely had well he's clearly grifting like he's he's tr got a podcast that he's plugging and there's no way that he's not trying to make money off of being on the jury and I, that, that that's surely got to sway his decision a little bit i mean I'll, I'll, I'll characterize that as an uncharitable interpretation but it's certainly possible but i mean if we want to be ch most charitable as possible even at best He's an open activist for the case that he was going to get this guy guilty no matter what happened, no matter what the evidence was. And that alone is horrible. If you enjoyed this segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can watch the full broadcast live every weekday at 1pm UK time on lotuseaters.com.